Good morning, everyone, and welcome. Uh, it is so good to have all of you here with us today. For those of you that were here with us last year and were chased out of town a little bit early by Hurricane Michael, I certainly want to say welcome back and thank you for being brave enough to come back uh, to the Alabama Gulf Coast in the fall. I think when most parts of the country think about fall, they think about cooler weather and changing leaves. We get 110 degree heat indexes and hurricanes. So, uh, but I, I do appreciate y'all uh, being here with us today. We've got a great morning planned for you. Um, after I share for a few minutes, we're going to have the privilege of hearing from Bob Carey. Bob is the chief market strategist at First Trust, and he's going to be sharing with us his thoughts on the global investment landscape um, and a whole lot more. Um, and then after that, our great money managers are going to take the stage. Um, they are all here with us today, and we appreciate them so much for all that they do to help us achieve our mission. Um, but you're in for a real treat. They'll be sharing their thoughts on not only their particular uh, parts of our portfolio, but also the, the global marketplace. Um, as well. And then we'll wrap up by focusing in on a couple of um, key managers to end our day. But um, this morning, I'd like to talk to you for a minute about something that we at the Baptist Foundation of Alabama attempt to do every day, and that is to make an impact. I think that impact is a word that gets used fairly casually in our culture today, fairly often in our culture today. But this morning, I want to focus in on what it really means to us at the Foundation to make an impact, specifically what does it mean to make a positive impact on our clients, whether they be uh, individuals or churches or other ministries, and also a positive impact on everyone that we come across um, for Christ. But before we do that, I think when we think about making an impact, often we think about something that someone chooses to do, but sometimes you can make an impact by what you choose not to do, as you'll see in this funny video. Are you unsatisfied with your golf game and looking to make major improvements that'll make you happier? Well, I'm here to tell you about one of the most revolutionary pieces of golf technology ever created. Introducing Quit Golf. I shave 94 strokes off my game, all thanks to Quit Golf. Since Quit Golf, my blood pressure has gone down considerably. I mean, it's still pretty high. <laughs> and this product doesn't cost you any money. In fact, it saves you money. Think about everything you could do with that money. Start a business, save for retirement, send a child to college, donate to a nonprofit, literally just burn the money. Really anything other than directly funding your mental and emotional demise. When I first tried Quick Golf, I threw my bag in the woods and then my wife said she'd consider moving back in eventually. <laughs> Once I stopped trying to be John Daly on the course, I stopped being John Daly off the course. Finally, no more texting your golf scores to people who literally don't care. Imagine driving to the golf course and then turning around and driving home. You'll have time to hug your children, play with your pets, date your spouse, or find a spouse. Literally anything to distract you from not driving your golf cart off a cliff. When delusion whispers to you, hey, remember that birdie you got two years ago? You should join the tour. Well, our common sense approach will tell you the truth. You're just not that good. Golf is hard. Sometimes you hook the ball. Sometimes you slice the ball. Sometimes you don't connect at all. Well, quit golf fixes all of that. Imagine. No more lessons, no more gadgets, no more custom clubs. In fact, no more clubs. Thanks to Quick Golf, I've never been happier. I've saved over $10,000 and I've completely turned my life around, all thanks to Quick Golf. Golf, just quit playing. Dever, if you're watching this, please let me see the kids. <laughs> so I don't know. Maybe uh, some of the folks on it play golf today want to implement that, uh, that strategy in their game. But anyway, let's take a minute and, and focus in on, on impact. If you were to look up impact in the dictionary, you would see that it can either be used as a verb uh, or a noun. As a verb, it means to come into forcible contact with another object or have a strong effect on something. Then as a noun, the action of one object coming into contact with another or the effect or influence of one object on another. But I think if we're honest, we know that everything that we do makes an impact in some way, whether it's through our Christian walk or through our work or our family. Everything we do has an impact. So the question becomes, how are we going to choose to make that impact? As Christians, I think we know we're called to make an impact uh, for God and his kingdom. Jesus tells us in Matthew 5, we are the light of the world, so let our light shine before others to glorify God and expand his kingdom. And recently, I heard one of the most amazing stories of Christian impact. And it's the story of a man by the name of Edward Kimball. And the story starts in 1854, where Edward was a boy Sunday school teacher in Detroit, Michigan. And uh, he personally committed himself to impact each one of those boys for Christ and also pray for them. But he noticed one day there was a boy in his class, a boy by the name of Dwight, 
who had not accepted Christ. So even though he was a very shy and very timid man, Edward went to where Dwight was working, his uncle's shoe store up into the loft, and he shared Christ with Dwight. But he left there that day thinking that he had failed, that Dwight had not accepted the Lord. But he was wrong. He actually made an impact on that boy, Dwight, whose name was Dwight Moody, that we probably know better today as D.L. Moody. D.L. Moody was one of the most famous evangelists in the 1800s. His ministry touched millions of people, led to the formation of the Moody Bible Institute and the Moody Memorial Church in Chicago, which sent thousands of missionaries out into the field. And so if our story stopped there, what a story of impact the Lord allowed Edward Kimball to have. But it's actually not the end of our story. It's, it's just the beginning, because D.L. Moody shared the gospel with a man by the name of Wilbur Chapman. Wilbur was a famous evangelist as well. Wilbur shared the gospel with thousands of people. And one day, Wilbur was holding a meeting uh, where he was sharing the gospel, and a baseball player came on his day off. And he happened to hear the message and receive Christ. And when that baseball player retired from playing baseball, he actually took over Wilbur Chapman's ministry, and his name was Billy Sunday. Billy was bold in his faith and fairly controversial in the 1920s for making statements like, going to church doesn't make you a Christian any more than standing in the middle of a garage makes you a car, which I guess didn't go over very well in those days. But Billy Sunday went in 1924 to Charlotte, North Carolina, and he held a rally there. And there were a group of men in Charlotte that accepted Christ, and they decided they wanted to have another event there to honor God. And so they asked an evangelist by the name of Mordecai Ham to come and speak at that event. It was a multi-day event, and on the very first night, a skinny young farm boy from Charlotte, North Carolina, came forward, and later on in the week, he would uh, go on to, to receive Christ. His family called him Billy Frank, but that was just a nickname. You probably know him better as Billy Graham. And as we know, Billy Graham went on to become one of the most impactful evangelists our generation has known. And, uh, but... But what an impact the Lord allowed Edward Kimball to have over his life. And at the foundation, we have the privilege of hearing stories of impact like this and seeing them almost every day, stories of Christians long ago or Christians today choosing to make a multi-generational impact for Christ uh, through our ministry. Today, we manage, as Barry said, over $250 million entrusted to us by generous Christians who wanted to provide financial fuel for their favorite ministries until Jesus returns. Today, we manage over 350 church investment funds, and we have over 2,000 accounts that we've opened benefiting churches and ministries, again, to provide them financial fuel as they go to impact the world for Christ. One specific area, oh, excuse me, and uh, since we uh, were founded 1940, since 1945, we've distributed over $365 million to provide that kingdom fuel uh, to those ministries. And we continue to make distributions to those every year. One specific area of impact that we see is in the area of scholarships. Um, through scholarship funds established at the Baptist Foundation, we've had the privilege of sending thousands of young world changers for Christ out into the harvest fields uh, to advance the gospel. And with over 100 different scholarship funds, last year we were able to award about a half million dollars to over 550 students who will go on to become the next pastors and missionaries and church leaders around Alabama uh, and around the world. We often say we wonder if the folks that gave those scholarship funds really knew how many future ministry leaders they would educate and then how many people would be impacted for Christ because of those ministers. And on the horizon, we see more impact coming through our legacy ministry. Legacy ministry or legacy planning is a different way for Christians to think about a process that almost no one enjoys, which is estate planning, and replaces it with a spiritual process where those Christians get before the Lord and pray meaningfully about who does the Lord want them to be the next best manager of all that he has entrusted to them. And since we started this ministry about 10 years ago, we've seen over 800 families go through planning with us, go through legacy planning, and prayerfully consider what the Lord's calling them to do. And those 800 families collectively have put plans in place to give over $260 million charitably, with over 92% of that going to ministry and the majority of it going uh, to the local church. But every one of those funds must be uh, administered at the foundation and invested, which is why we're here. So let me take a minute and remind you of the investment philosophy here at the foundation. There are four different parts. They're all interconnected. None stands on their own. And they form the foundation of our investment process. The first is the importance of asset allocation. 
Uh, we rely on some great managers to help us achieve our goals, but we know that if we don't get the allo asset allocation right between equities and fixed income and alternatives, that we won't get the return that our clients need uh, to advance their ministry. And so while we think about manager selection, we also think about asset allocation. Next is the importance of downside protection, or what are we doing to prepare our clients for the headwinds that we know are going to come, the volatility that we know is going to come. We often say you win by not losing, and so while we think about asset allocation, we also think about downside protection. Third is transparency is essential. We ask our managers to give us transparency on fees, investments, answer our questions in a timely way, and our clients should certainly expect that from us as well. And then something that lays across all of those is we want to take the time to understand our clients' needs and match the investments to that. We have an endowment fund that we think is a great vehicle for lots of our clients, but it's not going to be perfect for everyone, so we want to take the time to figure out where they should be invested. Something we take very seriously as well is our stewardship responsibility with the investments that we hold. We know that we, like our clients, will stand before the Lord one day and answer for the way that we've handled the resources that he entrusted to us. And we know that we, like our clients, don't want to stand before him and say that we invested them in a way that did not bring him honor and bring him glory. And so we put screens in place to remove those businesses that we think don't align with our faith. Things like alcohol, tobacco, pornography, gaming, because at the end of the day, we agree with a gentleman by the name of Peter Buckley, a pastor in the 1500s, who said, if God be God over us, let us yield him universal obedience in all things. He must not be over us in one thing and under us in another, but he must be over us in everything. Or said a different way, if the Lord is Lord of our life, he should be Lord of our investments also. So while we think it's important to help our clients avoid the bad, We've also begun to spend more and more time looking at investments to allow us to help our clients embrace the good, or what we'll call impact investing. If you look at the traditional, traditional spectrum of deploying assets in this area, you'll see that to the far right, traditional investing sought to always maximize financial return with little consideration for impact. And then on the left side, philanthropy or charitable giving obviously sought to maximize impact with very little consideration for financial return. But in recent years, we've seen something else rise up to occupy the space in between. First, socially responsible investing, which attempted to, or attempts still, to generate a, a return while keeping in mind social or environmental factors. And then also impact investing, which attempts to achieve not only a meaningful financial return, but also a meaningful spiritual or kingdom return. And that's where we are focusing. We've spent a good bit of time looking at the institutional space in this area. There's a growing number of institutional opportunities in this space. There's also a number of private companies that uh, are trying to make an impact on their business. And let's take a, a look at one of those examples right now. Within just a year or two after having our son, Nelson, um, Ash and I were three days from divorce, going through fighting for custody of our son. I was a drug addict, and our lives were upside down. We were a million and a half dollars in debt, $99,000 overdrawn, and our whole life was falling apart. So the pressure of that was just building and building, and I kept hearing in the back of my mind, this life you have is not worth living. You ought, to, you ought to kill yourself. We had this old historic house, and I went up in the attic of it. It was a junky old house that kind of re represented our junky old life, just broken and needing of everything. And went in the attic of that house and moved the attic fan out of the way, had set up a rope, and I decided I was just going to hang myself, that, that if I would take my own life, it would be the very best thing that could happen. And during that time, something just, just moved me, cry out to a God I never knew. And I thought, oh my gosh, he was there all along. And I kept hearing kill myself and he was going die to yourself. And it sounded so similar. And when I went down those stairs, I met Ash just r right after that. And we had been, of course, fighting through this divorce. I said, I got saved. And she said, you're a liar. Yeah, I didn't believe him when he came downstairs and tried to tell me that he was different. I just thought it was one more thing that he was trying to do to manipulate me to stay or to do something that would cause me to lose Nelson. 
I was about right at eight weeks pregnant and knew something was just wrong, you know. So I went to the doctor and he confirmed that um, I had lost the child. And, and so I just, I, I just I literally puddled on the floor in a heap and just cried the hardest I think I've ever cried. And I just sat there and was like, oh, dear God, you've got to help me. Get me away from me, you know. Um, and I had the most wonderful experience from there. <laughs> I stood up and I was so different and I had not done anything. I had not done anything at all besides surrender. Through years of counseling and lots of slowly by slowly decisions, we found one another and began to build a life that was amazing. So for seven years, literally seven years, every week, we went to counseling. We ended up being, gosh, like the poster child for failed marriages, but for people that just wanted a glimpse of hope. We just attracted broken people um, because they were attracted to our story, that there's, there's hope for people who are broken, that there's beauty in broken things. That was not just what happened to us, but that's what God wanted to do through us. Say, Vega. Remember, we're doing rolling doors on those. That so we truck. started our construction company with $1,000. Ash would teach our son during the day, and I'd go out and do rot repair on houses, working for just a little bit of money and one paycheck at a time. God was working on our skill set. You know, God doesn't waste time. He's always taking what you're doing and weaving it into where you're going. Coming together. We began to put our heart, all of our resources, our time, energy, and our dreams into this little small town, Opelika, which we say it's kind of like Hope You Like -a. We decided that we wanted to be right here where we had our first child. Everything, All of our first happened right here within a block away. We believe that hyper-focus in any area can change it. And so we just decided to stay here. So we have a real estate company that has over 100 pieces of property, primarily locally, within 10 blocks of this where we're sitting right now. From that, developed our construction company because we actually couldn't afford to hire other contractors. Now we're a historic renovation business. And out of that came our architectural salvage business. We're a restaurant group with multiple restaurants. We have a consulting company that's my primary focus, which is helping people restore cities. We call ourselves Marsh Collective now because I've tried to find a way to bring together multiple companies, multiple entities, multiple ownerships into a, a singular way to communicate. The priority goal for us is to find out who this loving God is. It seems pretty cool that he would meet us in the place that he did because it wasn't in where we told we had to be to meet him. It wasn't in a church and it wasn't in this special moment of a certain song being played or someone praying with us, you know? It was just us, raw, dirty, jacked up us. There is hope. You know, that, that God loves idiots. That God still takes broken things and does beautiful things. That there is an amazing God that still does amazing things. And what we do is we try to translate hope into every environment that there is hope. That's a pretty amazing story of the Lord's um, redemption, but let me be very clear. We are not invested in Marsh Collective. We do not have any plans to be invested in Marsh Collective, but I hope it gives you a sense of the companies that are out there that view business as a mission and where reaching the world for Christ is part of their corporate DNA. There's a growing number of these companies, and we are prayerfully considering uh, where our next impact investment will be, whether it be on the private company side or on the institutional side. Let me give you a quick glimpse of the institutional side. There's quite a few opportunities we're looking at. Things from private equity and venture capital, like Sovereign's Capital or Equal Venture Fund. Mutual funds and ETFs, you'll see one of our managers, Eventide, prominently displayed there. Investment intermediaries, like the Impact Foundation, Kingdom Capital. And then incubators and accelerators, like Praxis and Synapis. But 
We're going to be taking a look at all of these because we think it needs to be, this impact investing needs to be a larger part of our endowment fund. And so we'll be reporting to you on that um, in the future. But you know, I began my time this morning by sharing the impact story of Edward Kimball and Billy Graham. I'd like to end there um, as well. Let's take a minute and hear Dr. Graham share his salvation story in his own words. And one day there came an evangelistic campaign to our tat to Charlotte like, like this. And I went to that meeting and I listened to a preacher stand up and open the Bible in a way I'd never heard a preacher open the Bible before. And I went back night after night. And one night I was so under conviction of my own sins and my need of Christ that I joined the choir. And I couldn't sing, I, could, I couldn't sing a lick. I wanted to get away from having to look at the preacher. And I sat down beside a fellow by the name of Grady Wilson. First time I ever saw him, ever met him, he was up there for the same reason. <laughs> because this preacher would stand up and point his finger right at you. And then he would tell all the sins that you'd ever done and you thought maybe your mother had talked to him. <laughs> but one night I opened my heart to Christ and I walked down out of that choir and stood down there in front I didn't have any tears. I didn't have any emotion. I didn't hear any thunder. There was no lightning. There was nothing. And I thought to myself, there's something wrong with me. I didn't feel all worked up. I went home that night and got out on my knees and I said, oh God, I don't understand all this. I don't know what's happening to me. But as best I know how, I give myself to you. The direction of my life began to change. Come and give your life to Christ. Surrender to him. He's calling you by name, a certain man, a certain woman, a certain girl, a certain boy, and say, by coming, I want to commit my life totally and completely to Jesus Christ. And so as we know, Billy Graham went on to become known as America's pastor, and it's thought that he preached uh, in person to over 2 billion people in over 185 countries with 2.2 million people accepting Christ in person there at one of those events and countless others uh, doing the same through his television ministry, his 33 books, uh, or other parts of his ministry. And all of this started with a, a shy Sunday school teacher by the name of Edward Kimball. And so I'll close with this, and it's something that we think about um, a lot at the Baptist Foundation. Are we doing all that we can to make an impact for Christ. And that's why, honestly, we spend a, a lot of time and a lot of energy on legacy ministry and why we're looking at these impact investments. Are we doing all we can to make an impact for Christ, to be a difference maker in the lives of others? I think each one of us could probably look back over our lives and identify someone or maybe several someones that impacted our lives, and without them, we wouldn't be uh, the people that we are today because of them. And I think it's that kind of impact that God calls us to have on other people. And so while most of us may not have the impact that Billy Graham did. I might like to challenge us, myself included. Let's go make the maximum impact we can where God has planted us. And who knows, we might be the Edward Kimball in somebody else's story, which will be pretty cool. But uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you for coming this morning. And thank you for the opportunity that we have to assist you as you attempt to make an impact. We have a 10-minute break right now, and then we'll reconvene. Thank you again so much.